Folks, this is Tom Oprey, your host to the podcast where we ask the tough questions regarding man's impact on the world's wildlife. Raw and unfiltered, we strive to help you fully understand the real issues at hand. Our goal, ensuring the world's wildlife and wildlife habitat exists forever. Stay tuned for another edition of Shepherds of the Wild. In today's podcast, we have a special guest, the Secretary General of CITES, Yvonne Higuero. Yvonne, what is CITES? Well, at the time that CITES was uh, designed, there were major problems with overexploitation of certain species already. They started uh, working on CITES in the late 1960s, early 1970s, until it was created, uh, until the final uh, text was finished at, in 1973 and then it came into effect in 1975. So it was really this issue of overexploitation of wildlife and wild species of animals and plants and already had some, there were some listings already that existed in the United States and it was thought that, well, why not make this an international agreement? And that's how it was born because it was seen that the trade in this, these wild species was not regulated at all and it needed regulation. They needed to make sure that it was legal because some of it obviously was illegal because they were going into places and, and taking whatever wild species they wanted. And there were other instances where it was not being uh, sustainable because again, uh, nobody was taking care of the populations and everything, you know, like how much was left of this species, they were just simply mining it. And then traceable that you would be able to know from uh, th throughout the value chain that everything that was done was appropriate, legal, and, um, and, and, and legally, legally sourced from the very beginning. Yeah, we have a long history as a species of not being very good neighbors with the rest of the animals on the planet. Absolutely. How important are rural indigenous communities in wildlife conservation? Local communities and indigenous people in CITES are very important. They have a, they're a major stakeholder. They have a huge role to play. So these indigenous people and local communities who live in, in these ecosystems, in forest ecosystems, near marine ecosystems, terrestrial, all sorts of terrestrial ecosystems, and with these wild species of fauna and flora, have been managing them for thousands of years and have this traditional knowledge and know how best to manage them. And in, mo in many cases, many studies have been able to show that those species managed by indigenous people and local communities actually fare better than and others that are, do not have their oversight. There seems to be a huge divide amongst small rural countries around the world and the much larger industrial nations with larger populations. How can we get these countries to come together to better do what's best for wildlife? That's a really good point about how to make sure that the global community is aware of what's happening at the local level is basically what you're saying because many of these countries that are mega biodiverse countries are actually in the developing world and they're the ones who have to invest in the costs of conservation that is not generally not very well known in the industrialized world and the developed world about what it means to conserve, yet they benefit from it, the, from, from the conservation that these people are carrying out on a daily basis. And not only, be, not only the conservation aspect, but the fact that there is opportunity costs, right? Because they, if they can't use it, if, you know, they can't often turn, a hab we would prefer that they not turn a habitat for a particular species like elephants into a, into a, a, a soybean uh, crops or soybean field. So it's in our best interest to have a better understanding of what it means to be in the develop, developing world where these mega biodiverse countries are having to invest quite a lot in conservation costs to be able to maintain these habitats, to be able to maintain these species. Imagine, I went to visit in Zimbabwe, uh, Hawangi Park, and saw that there was drought and they have to struggle to be able to have enough water for the elephants and other species that are there and this costs a huge amount of money. They have to do anti-poaching exercises. This means they need to have lots of rangers, they need to dress them, they need to have vehicles, they need to have weapons. 
all of this has a tremendous cost. And so we need to become better informed in the, in the industrialized world about the benefits that we receive from having those species. And sometimes it's just the knowledge that those species exist. You may never go on safari to see these species, but you want to know that they are there and that they're well taken care of. Well, that has a cost and I think we have to share that. Uh, we have a co-responsibility to ensure that these species are maintained. So we have that responsibility to these rural communities to benefit from their hard work and conservation. You know, if they do, then why should they benefit? So they should benefit. Well, firstly, they, they as anybody else, wants to put food on the table, wants to send their children to school, want to have access to health benefits, right? They're very much like any other human being. So they have a right to be able to develop and have their, and have their incomes and find ways of working, getting jobs, etc. So they deserve to find, to have ways uh, in the, in near, living near these habitats, living near these ecosystems, living side by side with this wildlife to be compensated in some way for that not only because as a, as a human right and because they're, they deserve to have uh, a, the same kind of life anybody else would like to have, but also they need the incentives to conserve those places. If they didn't have the incentives to conserve that wildlife, that which involves both flora and fauna, that are found in these ecosystems, we would be in very in a lot of trouble. Imagine with climate change, how these are often carbon sinks as well, right? And if we they weren't taken care of, that we could be losing all of these carbon sinks and it worsening climate change. So they have to have incentives. And now it can be consumptive or non-consumptive uses. You know, we have tourism, but there's also they 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 use the wildlife as well. They use for both plants timber. Let's think about timber uses. We have have, uh, we have just, I just visited Laos in Southeast Asia and saw how this agarwood farm that is benefiting and several of these families have agarwood on their, on their uh, land and they're able to benefit from this, this business of providing agarwood oil for pr producing perfumes, for example. And in this one place that we went to, this one business, they maintain 500 families through this business because they are benefiting from the use of this timber. Along those same lines of the last question, rural communities have often been neglected when it comes to the worldview decisions on the sustainable wildlife trade, even though they stand to benefit economically or, on the other hand, bear the brunt of human wildlife conflict. How can these rural communities see justice? I mean, I'm, I'm attending my first CITES. I've heard different countries complain about this. I've seen NGOs that don't like these people. There is a lot of things going on here, but I'm trying to understand is how wildlife, when it benefits and when people take care of it because they benefit from it, I see conflict here. Why do we have this conflict and how can we overcome it? There is conflict about uh, in, in, in what, how do we engage these stakeholders? There's not really a uniform or agreement on how to engage these, what we would call major stakeholders as they are in the United Nations. The, the indigenous people and local communities are major stakeholders in many things about sustainable development, but also about wildlife conservation. So there's a disagreement, I think. What I can see is, as we are discussing here, several decisions that have to do with livelihoods, about there has been some proposals about having a committee of, uh, of stakeholders like indigenous people and local communities representatives to be participating in CITES. So there's discussions about is that something that CITES should be concerned about? Are there other ways in which these stakeholders could take part? So some are suggesting that it's not really an international uh, activity that they should be involved in, but they should be involved in more at the national level where the parties themselves should put in place legislation and ways in which they can then consult with these local communities and indigenous people when they're putting forth proposals within CITES. So there's some ideas about that's really the place that this should be done. Others think that uh, no, there should be more international uh, discussion with the, with the local communities and indigenous people involved in the meetings. This, this is therefore this idea of having a committee with uh, uh, what they call a subcommittee under the standing committee. But there's another, we already have a resolution that encourages parties that they should include them in their delegations when they're coming to CITES meetings. There's already a resolution on that. 
But unfortunately, I don't see a lot of that happening. From time to time, I see some uh, indigenous people and local communities participating, but not a lot. So I think we need to encourage this more. Um, they need to be consulted more. So we have to find ways. I think we have to find agreement. There is that conflict. I really think that we have to stop this polarization and really have a discussion and sit around the table and think, find ways in which we can come to common ground and finding ways to involve them. Because at the end of the day, and it's it's and everybody knows this, that in these in these uh, areas where there's lots of wildlife, it's about 70 70 percent of the people who are there are local communities and indigenous people. So if we want to make changes and we want to achieve our sustainable development goals and we want to address the triple planetary crisis we have pollution, climate change, and loss of biodiversity here, what we're doing is looking at how we halt the loss of biodiversity, which includes, of course, wild, wild species of plants and animals. We need to involve all stakeholders, and major stakeholders in this business are definitely the local communities and indigenous people. So I urge parties to find ways in which they can sit at the table and talk to each other and make sure that it is not a conflict and that they feel heard. Everybody wants to feel heard. And if and find alternative solutions because sometimes as a conservation convention, it is a conservation convention. We need to be worried about the conservation of these wild species for future generations. But we need to also give alternatives when those decisions have to be made to put these species on the, on the, appendices, on the appendices of CITES. We have to have a discussion about what alternatives can be offered to the local communities and indigenous people when that happens. CITES was created and based on scientifically proven outcomes. That's the whole purpose behind the treaty. In my time here, talking to people and listening to debates, knowing that you have a couple of different major factions, anti-use versus use, well, you know, communities, uh, people on one side and, and anti-use people on the other, it seems emotions have crept into the decision-making process. How does CITES revert back to science-based decisions? Well, I think CITES is still based on scientific evidence. If you look at the assessments that are carried out, when these proposals are put forward, the Secretariat, IUCN, uh, FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, and many others who are working together as partners under CITES, do put the assessments out to give the scientific evidence. And we base it on, when we make our assessments, we based on what scientific evidence is there. We do our best. But of course, there are other things that come into play. We, we don't operate in a vacuum. So there are other things that come into play. Feelings always come into play when we're talking about wild animals and plants. There is no way to separate that. But I think what is needed here, again, is for more information, more built, building that awareness amongst people. What are the needs of the people who are living side by side with this, these wild species? I don't think that we have enough of that information. And really, I would encourage journalists like yourself, you need to put out, and I know that you have put out this film, you need to put out this film so you can, you can share those other feelings because those are feelings, those create feelings too. When you see the struggle of local communities having to deal with the expansion of the populations of certain types of wildlife like elephants, that really there's been very much success in many countries in Africa in the, in, and also in Asia in the increase of the populations of many wildlife species such as elephants, but that can eventually create human uh, wildlife conflict. And you have to go there and you have to, you have to show what is it that's happening at, the, at these local levels with the people to bring the empathy. We need more empathy. We need to put ourselves in other people's shoes to have a better understanding of what they're living through. And that's what CITES, I hope we can do more of that with your help. I, I really urge that we have to have more journalists who bring to life what it is like to live side by side with the wild species and how we can make sure that they have better lives and that they are compensated for what they're doing in taking care of these wild species. My last question, back in March, working with the Geneva Environmental Network, we had a screening of the film Killing the Shepherd, our educational version. It was awesome to have you be a part of that panel discussion. How important were the themes in the film? I mean, when you first watched the film, how did it affect you? How did you feel? How did it strike you? So, yes, I took part in the panel uh, of discussion after watching Killing the Shepherd. 
and of course, of course, it raised a lot of lots of feelings as well about the local communities, and again, this um, how how they I think that they are very much alienated from their own culture and how they're used to doing things when we don't listen to them and when we don't help them um, uh, be able to achieve their achieve their objectives of you know having a better life, improving their lives. So it did. It raises always the questions, are we doing enough for local communities and, and indigenous people? And bringing back the message that we have to, again, have a balanced view about things. Yes, we are concerned about the loss of biodiversity and the loss of species, and we need to take decisions sometimes that are hard decisions, but we should take them based on scientific evidence. We need to also consult and find ways in which those communities can be assisted, supported. Again, I don't think any of them want to have anybody giving money to them or giving it away to them, but finding ways in which with dignity they can live, have jobs, and be able to, to ensure that these, these wild species of fauna and flora continue to exist for the benefit of everybody in the world. So those were the kinds of feelings I had, that we need to communicate better, this, get at this information out about the reality of life at the local level next to wildlife, and find ways in which, with dignity, they can have a good life, they can take care of their children, and take care of their, and, and take care of their communities. In the end, it's all about the community for them, and they want to make sure that everybody fares well. Thanks for listening. You can find this podcast wherever great podcasts live, including on the Shepherds of Wildlife Society website at shepherdsofwildlife.org. Please tell a friend and let's save wildlife together.